Thank you very much, Alistair. I too have uh, used Trove to discover things about my grandparents and uh, family members that I didn't know. I discovered that my two great aunts came first and second at the, uh, in the athletics at the picnic day that was held in 1919 up the north coast a year after the war. Who knew they could run? <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, and I did mean to mention at the start too that if you do have a mobile phone, just turn it down. I just remembered then, so just a belated, a belated message to you. Now to part one, democracy, the role of government and the development of the digital citizen. Alastair McGibbon is Australia's first children's e-safety commissioner. Prior to this appointment, Alastair was general manager security at Dimension Data, a director of the Centre for Internet Safety at the University of Canberra, as well as CEO of Crest Australia, a not-for-profit uh, that certifies white hat ethical hackers. Uh, all these new terms and phrases that we had never even heard of 10 or so years ago. He also worked as a federal agent with the Australian Federal Police for 15 years and was the founding director of the Australian High Tech Crime Centre. Welcome to Alastair. Thank you, Louise. Uh, thanks, Alex, and hello, Sue. Thanks very much for having me today. I genuinely appreciate being here. Of course, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that I, I am actually a regulator of internet content, uh, and having heard uh, Alex speak, um, I, I know this is a, a vexing issue because I am a regulator. I'm a big believer in the role of libraries and access to information. I'm a, a supporter of the metadata retention laws. Alex, I know you like to retain data. I also like government uh, telling people to retain that too so they can access it, which I know is a vexed question amongst uh, uh, people in the audience. And I believe in the right to be forgotten sometimes, uh, but not always. Uh, all issues that Alex uh, mentioned in his introduction, and I'm happily, happy to address any of those questions, by the way, during the, the Q&A session. I guess the point I'd like to make is that uh, information is clearly extremely powerful. You know that as people in this profession. Uh, and sometimes that information can be dangerous to the individual, to society more broadly. The same goes with on the internet, in fact, possibly more so. Uh, on the 1st of July last year, I was appointed as the Children's eSafety Commissioner, the first such position that I know of anywhere in the world, uh, with some quite unique legislation that I will go into some detail on uh, at a later stage. But my belief is the internet is a great democratisation tool. I think most of you would agree that it is indeed uh, that that, uh, that tool, that it is a great enabler of individuals to access information that once was uh, uh, known impossible to find. Uh, uh, Alex can find about his dad, uh, Louise can find about her aunts, uh, uh, I can find out about uh, long lost family members, or bits of information that were, would, once I would have to walk into the, to the uh, great, uh, great institutions that many of you work at today, and now I can do much of that online. Uh, uh, or I can come into these institutions and access remarkable information. I can, of course, as we all know, uh, publish information myself. Uh, some of you are tweeting as we speak. Sue tweeted a photograph of me earlier, which was very kind of her. I hope she made me look like I had hair. Uh, uh, but, but all of us can do that. In the past, that was impossible. This is all clearly uh, known to you. Uh, but I would say to you that as a great enabler, it's a, it's a fragile one. When 50% of the users of the internet, women, are more targeted than men uh, in terms of trolling threats and abuse, then is it a great enabler? Is it a great enabler when 50% of the population has greater fear and trepidation to use it? Yesterday was International Women's Day. Uh, and when I look online as a male, I'm not always proud. I'm not proud because we've sort of learnt how to behave offline. We've learnt how to be more politically correct. We know largely, though not always perfectly, how to behave in offices, in parks and sometimes in our family homes, and we'll get to domestic violence shortly. Uh, but how are we going online? Uh, one of the great things about the internet is this perception of anonymity. I'd say as a former police officer, it's a perception of anonymity. You are not anonymous online. We may not know your name, but it's fair to say we can probably identify who you are uh, each time you do engage online. But the perception of anonymity and the concept of not seeing the person 
straight in front of you uh, has actually enabled men, largely, online to show their true colours. And it's not always a pretty colour. I have a very long speech I give about uh, the internet being a mirror. Uh, and I talk about child sex offenders, which I will do later today. I talk about scammers and other such people. And I look around the room. And, and we all know it's not us. I know it's not me that's abusive towards women online. I'm making the assumption it's not the other men in the room. Uh, I'm hoping it's not the women in the room. Then who is it? The internet being that great reflection of us gets pretty scary. So Norton, uh, a few days ago, came out with a figure saying that 76% of women under the age of 30 had experienced online harassment, including stalking, threats of violence, and so-called revenge porn, or the misuse of, of intimate images to threaten and harass. Plan Australia and Our Watch last week came out with some figures saying 7 in 10 young women believe girls are often bullied or harassed online and 58% agreed that girls often receive uninvited and unwanted, indecent or sexually explicit material online. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance uh, this week came out and said that 41% of female journalists have experienced online trolling. I find that figure surprisingly low. And 60% of respondents uh, believe that female journalists were more likely to have online harassment directed towards them. How are we going in terms of it being a democratisation tool? Uh, when the so-called fifth estate, when the workers in that fifth estate are threatened, harassed, threatened with rape and uh, violence, uh, if that uh, changes one keystroke of what uh, Louise would write, and I'm not saying it does, then it starts to tie uh, down the concept of that being a democratic tool. Uh, Government research released in 2014, one of the key pieces of research that uh, uh, brought about the formation of our office, which is designed to help protect children online, said that one in five Australian children each year suffer in some way from cyberbullying. Now, cyberbullying, by the way, because this is a, a question uh, that I often get asked, is uh, threatening, harassing, intimidating or humiliating uh, information uh, directed towards that child. Now, we only deal with serious cyberbullying, and I'll get into that definition shortly, uh, but, uh, but if one in five children are threatened, harassed, intimidated uh, the, in a year, then it's not a great democratisation tool for them either. Because even if it's not them that is targeted, if they see another person targeted, uh, then that in itself can silence those people because the effect on the bystander can be significant. Uh, and, and that, to me, is dangerous. So as an office, we were given specific legislation as a regulator to take down information, to take down threatening, harmful, intimidating and harassing information targeting Australian children. Now, the law is quite specific. Uh, industry consultation made sure that our powers aren't overly strong, which is good. Uh, we carry a small stick, but a stick nonetheless. Uh, uh, in the year, or sorry, in the, in, since 1st of July last year, we've signed up uh, Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, Google+, uh, YouTube, Flickr, uh, Yahoo Answers, Yahoo Groups and Ask FM uh, into our regime where we can uh, seek material to be taken down. And we've had 100% compliance in that. Now, some may ask whether that's information that should actually be retained and kept up. But I suspect most would say that the type of information we're taking down uh, that is truly harmful to those targeted uh, uh, should come down. Because it's not just harmful to them, it's harmful to their families, and we deal with those victims. We deal with those people that are targeted, menaced and harassed. We also have some power to compel a person to, to stop posting information uh, through any electronic means. So the Act allows me to take down material on uh, large, large social media sites, and we're working with more sites to see if we can extend our authority. That's difficult online. Jurisdiction's an interesting one. Companies can quickly retreat uh, and argue that the law doesn't apply, so we're taking a soft, uh, cooperative approach. But I can indeed issue notices to people that are sending SMSs, writing emails, uploading information online into blogs or, or onto social media services. A power that I haven't had to use yet. I have threatened to use it on a couple of times, but we don't want to, crimi we don't want to criminalise, we're not criminal law. We don't want to uh, start bringing kids into the legal system because these are largely children dealing with each other. And uh, what we want is for them to learn not to do it. Uh, because ultimately, 
uh, this is about cultural change. It's also about bringing support to people because in this great democratisation tool that allows us to access information in a very unfettered way, uh, that information might of course be uh, highly sexualised information, uh, hardcore uh, supposedly mainstream pornography that we know will impact upon young minds, undeveloped minds, kids that don't have uh, the, the physical or mental development to see that information. Um, it might be a pro-anorexic website or a bulimic website uh, that's accessed by a young woman who has uh, serious body issue questions and not the right type of support around it. Those types of information, of course, can be very harmful. So one of the things we do is have a strong partnership with Kids Helpline. And in the first six months of operation, we referred over 2,500 children for counselling. Uh, because, uh, and of that, by the way, only 100 or so times did we have to look at taking down information. So the vast bulk of the time was offering support. And further still, uh, our website and the various other services we run is really about empowering the individual. Empowering the individual not to be harmed by the information, know how to use the information, know how to consume information, know how to determine information that is uh, potentially harmful to them brings us to the issue of violent extremism and the ability of uh, uh, violent extremists online to recruit young people uh, to, to lead them to their death uh, or to cause harm to the community around them. And so that to me is a digital literacy question. That to me is helping teach kids, helping empower children and their families to interpret information that is so freely available online to make good choices. So we're not in the uh, hard end of uh, enforcement, we're in the empowering end, but we are indeed a regulator. But if all we did was take down information, then we'd be playing a whack-a-mole game that we can't win. Uh, a game that we invariably lose, not just because of the volume of information, a misstep on our part, a failure of someone to report a problem to us. So we are about education and change, and we're about positive digital citizenship. To us, a good digital citizen does three things. They engage positively online, as you'd expect a citizen to do. Uh, they know their online world and they choose consciously when to engage and when not to engage. And we try desperately to help kids to do that. Now, I don't know how long I can be saying this for, but we've failed. I'm hoping I can keep saying it for at least several of my five-year appointment. Oh, actually, I'd prefer not to be saying it at all, uh, but we've failed. Our government has failed in this space. Families, frankly, have failed in this space. Let me give you a few simple examples. If I go for a run around the lake, an all too seldom uh, yet beautiful uh, thing to do, and I look on a weekend at uh, kids in the park and I think to myself, fantastic. Here we are, a country worrying about obesity, worrying about screen time for kids. There's a kid or kids playing in the park. And then I look closely at the adults that are supervising those children. What do you think they're doing? Yeah. So, because we've probably all done it. Uh, uh, I live on a farm, so I can't always uh, have a, a phone in front of me. Uh, but I do find, I do check myself regularly. And why have we failed? We've failed because the example we set as adults is often worse than what we see our kids doing. I went to a beautiful primary school in outer western Sydney uh, recently, actually with the Lana Madeline Foundation. And uh, uh, I was speaking to the headmistress before the event. And I, I, I reminded her that I'd written out to all the headmasters and headmistresses to explain what our office did and what powers we had and, and the other opportunities that we could offer those schools because uh, I'm a grateful inheritor of uh, 10 years' worth of work in schools by the, by the government now just amalgamated into our office. And she said to me, Alistair, that's great. It's great that you have these resources and that you can teach our kids. As you can see, these kids are beautiful kids. It was a lovely little primary school. We know every child here. We know them all. They're lovely children. The problem is our parents. They go online and they rip each other apart. If there's a dispute between the children, it's the mothers and the fathers that will get onto Facebook, Instagram and other places and cause harm. So we've failed. We've failed to set an example to our children on how to use this technology wisely. We've failed in terms of how we can educate children to use this wisely. And that is sad and it's wrong because we know the future, of course, is, is uh, uh, clearly has digital uh, as, as a key component, if not the main component in the future uh, democratisation and democratic involvement of, of Australian children. 
I'm a great believer in libraries. I have I, I, I'm a huge believer, and, and libraries are a great partner of our office. Uh, who here is from the ACT library system? Well, thank you to you guys. Uh, eSafe Spaces uh, is a pilot program. Yeah, I think we've, we've, we, we, we need to ramp it up, I suspect. But my son, uh, who goes to Dixon College, said to me, Where does your, what, what does your office do? Which is sad, because my wife asked the same question. Um, <laughs> And sometimes the minister does as well, which is even more worrisome for me. And I said, why do you say that, uh, honey? You know, uh, is that, uh, what have I done? And he said, well, I don't know, because everywhere I go, I see the Office of the Children's E-Safety Commissioner. I thought you just had some staff in Sydney and Melbourne. And I said, oh, why? And he said, well, I was in a library today. I was at Dixon Library, and I saw these signs. And then I was in the college library, and I saw more stuff from you guys, more posters. Libraries are indeed a great partner to digital literacy. And we were talking about this earlier on. And I appreciate the partnership with, with uh, libraries that we have as an office. And if eSafe Spaces works, and if nothing else, even if it just raises attention for Australian children and their families that there is a safe place for them to go that is digital, that is also about literacy, which is a library, then to me that is a win. I have very low standards for a win online. Uh, and to me that's a win. And if we can partner with you going beyond the ACT, then I think that would be a great concept. And Sue, thank you for your very strong support in that process and all, and all librarians that I've met with. I mentioned domestic violence. Let me briefly talk about that. In September last year, shortly after our office had opened, the Prime Minister uh, gave us some additional responsibilities. And that was to do with the technology facilitated abuse of women and children in domestic violence situations. It just rolls off the tongue um, like any good government program. Uh, but essentially what we're looking at is the way in which uh, offenders, domestic violence or family violence offenders use technology to extend their reach in terms of harassment, intimidation and threats towards women and children. And it wouldn't surprise you of course to know that technology is widely used and abused by those types of offenders. So while it's a great democratisation tool, it is also a potential tool of oppression. And we need to make sure that as we encourage the uptake of technology, that we develop the rule of law and societal expectations about the use of that technology to ensure that it is that great democratisation tool. As part of our education programs, soon to be released for women and uh, families in situations with domestic violence, we will increasingly be glass half full people showing how to use technology rather than run away from it. I think the great loss would be if women uh, if children, uh, if any person that is uh, marginalised in society can't use this technology, then it is no longer that democratisation tool. In fact, it's a tool for oppression. Uh, to do that, we are partnering with schools. We have for many years, partnering with libraries. We're increasingly trying to partner with corporates. Uh, not many uh, rational people go to my government website to learn how to behave, but they bank daily. Uh, they, they deal with a whole range of other corporates and we're increasingly working out how to have true deep engagement with corporates. I, I met with the CEO of ANZ on Safer Internet Day uh, uh, back a few weeks ago. You know, Safer Internet Day a year ago you wouldn't have had a, a CEO of a major corporate talking about how to keep their 50,000 families safe online. Uh, and we're rolling out more resources. In the next six months, in the years ahead, you'll see more and more resources that we are giving away uh, freely, as, as uh, uh, maturely as we can, as, as disruptively as we can, as we realise that failed distribution model of government, and hopefully we'll see big things. Uh, the last thing that I'd want to talk about uh, is this concept of uh, one of the great misuses of technology, and that's child sex abuse. I, I'm, I'm uh, proud to say that, uh, wow, uh, over 20 years ago I worked at the Wood Royal Commission into Police Corruption in New South Wales as an investigator. It was a sad uh, era to be a police officer. Uh, but I was involved in the child, uh, in the child sex abuse side, the, look, the link between the judiciary, the police and child sex offenders. And uh, sad thing is I listened to the radio driving uh, to hear the evidence given before the current Royal Commission is exactly the type of stuff we heard uh, 20 something years ago. And uh, you know, uh, I, I question how as a society we failed to, to change. But, but one of the conclusions I sadly made back 20-something years ago as this internet thing was starting is we thought the internet wouldn't be used by child sex offenders. 
I, I, I don't tell anyone else that I made such a fatal uh, mistake. Uh, we thought, I say we now because it's best if I say other people thought it as well, uh, that sex offenders were doing a great job uh, in uh, getting access to kids, grooming them uh, and engaging in uh, sex with them. They didn't need this internet thing, this slow, clunky thing that took a minute or two to upload a page. We would see them down at the beach during school hours at the motorbike uh, uh, tracks in outer suburbs of Sydney on weekends. Uh, they might be uh, teachers or police officers or other people in positions of trust. Uh, they didn't need this internet thing. I was wrong. In the first six months of operation of our office, we took down 4,008 uh, URLs, many of which pointed to hundreds if not thousands of images of children being sexually abused. Uh, all taken down within two days, uh, all taken down offshore in 50 countries. Uh, a remarkable tool being used by criminals. Remarkable enabler uh, that helps normalise behaviours, uh, helps find victims and helps offenders. So as a tool, a democratisation tool, it is also a tool that can be used for enormous and, and uh, continuing harm against children uh, and adults uh, you know, when we talk about a whole range of other crimes. So while we look at this great power of technology and the internet, uh, I would ask you to also consider the concept that the rule of law, uh, the concept of civil society needs to also uh, be front and centre in those uh, deliberations. I mentioned bystanders before and I'm going to conclude on, on two points. The first is bystanders. We all know when we've seen something traumatic happening that it doesn't have to have happened to us to be traumatised. If we see a bad motor vehicle accident uh, or, or someone uh, uh, get into trouble in some other way, uh, it impacts us as people. It doesn't take a lot of maths to work out that if uh, significant parts of our society are directly threatened by a technology and by the people behind those keyboards, then it will impact all of us. Uh, in my role, uh, I relish the thought of someone uh, trying to troll me. I'm more than happy to, to not listen to the words I tell everyone else to do and say don't engage trolls. I'm more than happy uh, to have it out with a troll online. Uh, but I'm wondering how many people are. Uh, and I wonder as bystanders whether we need to do better at standing up for others around us in this great online space that allows us to say what we think and to consume information so readily. Uh, when we opened our doors on the 1st of July, I suspected we were going to get pretty roundly attacked uh, by libertarian and privacy groups online. Not bad groups. Uh, but groups who thought it was wrong that there'd be someone online who actively took material down, first in the, in the world, uh, that we're going to compel social media services to take uh, information down. Uh, I'm happy to say, apart from a few incidents of comments that I've made that seem to have drawn the ire of some people, uh, uh, our office has been totally unscathed online and we are increasingly trying to have uh, a strong social media presence and to engage with people about how to behave, adults and children, because if we're going to uh, raise the children then the village itself needs to behave. Uh, and, and I can say with absolute pleasure and frankly with some, uh, some amazement that those same groups that would rail against government in ordinary, normal, daily battle of policy uh, have been quite supportive of us as we go about our business trying to help protect Australian children. And I think that uh, bodes well for the internet being a democratisation tool. Uh, thanks for having me today. Uh, I look forward to the Q&A session afterwards. Not sure how I've gone for time, but uh, with that, I'll leave you to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alistair. You've given us so much to uh, think about, to consider and to discuss. Um, like your son, I was recently at the Dixon Library picking up my reserved copy of Patti Smith's M Train. Most excellent read, highly recommend it. Rushing to finish it because it's due back in a few days. Uh, a book that I was able to order online and then I got a SMS to say when it was there. It was a fantastic service. Uh, but I noticed those signs too, those e 
uh, safe space, safety space signs. And uh, it just reminded me, my children are now pretty grown up. Well, I think they are. They're 26 and they're 23. But they have both said to me recently, I would hate to be a teenager today dealing with all the stuff that's going on on the internet. And I think, well, they're young. You know, they've been through that. But they say just in the last five or six years ago, they no they've noticed how much everything's changed. And so I feel as a parent that I'm lucky that I didn't have to deal with some of the really tough stuff that parents are doing now uh, in terms of protecting their children from cyberbullying and all the, and, and some really other horrible stuff that's on the internet. So thank you. Our next speaker is Colin.